Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special webcast brought to you by the Conference Board in partnership with Springbuck. I'm Amy Yi, researcher here at the Conference Board, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to today's program, Opportunity Amidst Chaos, How COVID-19 Might Change Healthcare. As many of you know, that COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way uh, patients seek care, especially during the lockdowns. So today we'll hear directly from experts from Springbok as they talk about what types of care have been impacted, the effect of the pandemic on future health care costs, and what companies can start thinking through and also planning in order to get ready for 2021 and beyond, also improve the overall well-being of their employees. Um, so in today's webcast, we'll be discussing a few questions and issues. And first is, what impact has COVID-19 pandemic had on healthcare com consumption so far? And as the pandemic resolves, what is likely to happen in healthcare? And what are some key strategies that companies might consider at this time in response to other changes in healthcare? And before we address these questions, I would like to go over a few details first about how you can best participate in today's webcast. Uh, first, I encourage you to actively engage in today's conversation. To do so, you can type your questions and comments in the chat box. We will save some time toward the end for our speakers to address your questions. The slides are available for you to download, and you can find the link on your screen. There will also be a very brief evaluation at the end of today's webcast, and we thank you in advance for your feedback. This webcast will be made available on demand on the Conference Board website shortly after today's live session. Please know that this webcast is approved for HRCI, SHRM, and CPE credits. If you haven't done so already, please click the link in the CEU uh, request pod to sign up for available credits for this event. So the pod is located in the bottom right corner of the webcast console. Um, please know that the CEU credits are only available for those of you who attend the entire live session. And also remember to respond to three pop-ups that will appear throughout the program. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, first, we have Anne Fisher, and Anne is the Data Science and Methods Senior Director at Springbuck. She has over 20 years of experience in the healthcare information technology. Uh, most of Anne's career was spent at Truven Health Analytics, which became a foundational component of IBM Watson Health. Uh, Anne joined Springbuck in 2019 to lead a Data Science and Methods team. Uh, we also have Penny Moore, who is the commercial, uh, Chief Commercial Officer at Springbuck. Penny uh, brings over 25 years of healthcare experience in the, working with self-funded employers through executive roles with companies like United Healthcare and Aetna. She also led growth strategies for early to mid-stage companies that are focused on improving the population health through digital technology. Penny joined the Springbuck team in the spring of 2020 to lead the sales and the marketing team. Welcome, um, Anne and Penny. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Um, so with that, Penny, shall I hand it over to you to um, get our stuff started? You bet. Thank you, Amy, and thanks to your conference board colleagues for support in producing today's webinar. Um, and to all of you in the audience, hello, and thanks for joining today. Um, whoops, there we go. A little sensitive there. Um, organizations focus intently on mission, and looking at our attendees today, I know that this is a focus that drives you. At Springbuck, we believe that mission matters. We imagine a world where every healthcare decision is backed and guided by data. Our mission is to prevent disease with data. It's universally applicable for every human being, and matters in times of economic prosperity as well as uncertainty. What we do, why we do it, and how we do it aligns with our mission. It dictates the products that we build, um, who we hire, and how we think about the industry. We are absolutely relentless about achieving our mission. We also understand that employers lead the healthcare ecosystem as the most aligned entity with you and me as human beings. Employers are rewarded when we are healthy and penalized when we're sick. Our focus is the challenges and opportunities of employer benefit teams. Springbuck's leading edge health intelligence platform offers deep insights 
empower smarter decision making, and provide strategic direction to help deliver benefit plans and programs that fit for the population. Because in today's economy, employers can't afford not to care. We extend beyond traditional data warehousing and analytics to help you unlock the potential of your data and maximize the value of your employee health investments. At Springbuck, we equip thousands of employers on their own journey to prevent disease with data. Our intelligence aids in making proactive data-informed decisions that guide these employers to adapt with agility and success. As a part of our presentation, we're really excited today to include some aggregate COVID-19 insights from our book of business, driven by Springbuck's health intelligence engine. As COVID-19 has turned the focus for employers, you are seeking data insights that will help guide your decisions during a time filled with uncertainty. We understand, um, we understand you are working hard to anticipate. Um, questions like, what will, uh, what will be the impact of COVID-19 on my 2021 health benefit spend? One of Springbox's responses to questions like that is our latest solution called Answers. It's a curated search tool powered by machine learning and natural language processing designed to equip benefit leaders with the right answers to their most pressing business questions in real time. Not, not having to wait for an analyst to come up with the answer. Powered by a team of scientists and clinicians, Springbuck has leveraged our health intelligence platform to generate data-driven COVID-19 predictive insights for our customers, supported by risk change analysis and other COVID-specific reports. Our data and product teams committed early on to diving in and understanding COVID, COVID's impact. We continue to pu publish their findings on our website. These resources are available to you for free at springbuck.com. And because of Springbuck's quick and supportive uh, COVID-19 response for our customers, we were recently recognized by HR Tech Awards as the best innovative tech solution of 2020. Then Eubanks, who is the founder of HR Tech Awards, cited that Springbuck's ability to identify COVID-19 risk factors in the workforce combined with the ability to show analytics in healthcare interventions that include the business impacts of those interventions were standout features. No one could have adequately prepared for COVID-19, but we can capitalize on current trends and data to predict and plan for what's next. That is exactly what our data science team, led by Ann Fisher, has done. In today's presentation, Ann has leveraged Springbuck's data, insight, data insights combined with an in-depth look at recent literature to illuminate where we see opportunity among chaos. This presentation is rich with resources, and I want to make sure that you know at the end of the presentation is the full a reference list of the resources that Ann used to put the presentation together. While many benefit leaders are rightly focused on near-term crisis strategies and supporting employee challenges, it's also critical to understand the potential of the long-term implications of the pandemic's, um, of the pan pandemic's ability to disrupt healthcare. While COVID-19 has impacted many aspects of care, we learn the magnitude of this impact on different services will vary, making it essential to look at microtrends across various subsets of care that may be affected differently. So Anne, are you ready to share what you've observed and learned? I am, can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Thank you, Penny. Thank you for the intro, and thanks, everybody, for your time today. Um, I will share that my internet booted me out of the presentation briefly while Penny was speaking. Hopefully, that was a one-time thing, and it won't happen again. Um, but I am located in Michigan, and we're having some storms today, so these are the things that happen. 
So my presentation today is divided into three main parts. And the first is going to be about healthcare, what it looked like prior to COVID-19, how it's changing as a result of the pandemic, and what we might expect to see next. The second part is really about that, about what we might expect to see next. What are the likely impacts that might occur as a result of what has happened over the past few months? And then finally, in the third part, we'll talk about where we think there could be big opportunities to come out of this pandemic and to end up with a more efficient and more effective healthcare system. So let's start with just what is happening today. And thank you. I, something technical just happened and I'm back. Okay. Uh, what, let's start with what happened today. So we, we often look at healthcare spending broken out by things like, you know, where did the care take place or who was the type of provider that provided the service. But today I'm going to have you help you look at this in a slightly different way using a more clinical lens. So we're going to look at the top conditions that are driving healthcare costs for commercially insured people, insured individuals. And then we're going to describe how those different conditions have been affected by the pandemic. So about half of all healthcare spending in the commercially insured population is driven by eight condition categories. And you can see them on this donut chart here on the graph. Um, topping the list are musculoskeletal disorders. So that includes stuff like arthritis, uh, low back pain, knee injuries, you know, those types of things. The second highest is cancer. And this is specifically cancer related to people being actively treated. So people in chemo, having surgery, having radiation. It's not necessarily the ongoing monitoring that happens after a person is recovered. Mental health and substance abuse are third. And then mild and moderate infections are fourth. And by the way, mild and moderate infections are here not because they're so expensive, but because they're so common. Right? So these happen all the time. Therefore, they end up in the top eight of cost from a cost perspective. And then we have diabetes, gastrointestinal disorders, pregnancy, and preventive care that round out the top eight. So why does this matter? Right? Why is this important when we're talking about COVID-19? Well, at Springbrook, we realized pretty early on that although, yes, healthcare costs were being impacted at a significant rate, yes, there was a big decline, not all conditions were equal. So not all conditions were going to be impacted in the same way. And so we started thinking about the impact of COVID in terms of what we call micro trends. And Penny used that term earlier. Um, so the way we illustrate it here is that the trend in healthcare spending, it's, it's not, it really never was a single trend, right? It's a, um, it's the net result of several underlying trends. And then when COVID hit, Yes, the overall cost definitely decreased in March and April, but not every trend acted in the same way. So as we continue to return to what we call a new normal, um, each of these microtrends is likely to behave differently. And we think that if we can understand those and describe them, we can anticipate the overall trend in a more informed way. So at a very high level, yes, healthcare spending dropped off significantly during March and April of 2020. And the data we're showing here comes from our Springbook customers, but I'm guessing that your data looks really similar to this. And one of the first things you'll notice looking at this graph is that the effect was concentrated on the medical portion and the prescription drugs were pretty much unaffected. So in fact, if you look at March, there was a little bit of an increase in March from prescription drug costs. And we suspect that was because the, there was a um, sort of a, a panic mode of people filling their prescriptions early during the lockdown because they were afraid perhaps they weren't going to be able to get them, right? So we think that might have explained that little blip. But generally, prescription drug spending has been relatively stable. So if we go back now to our top eight conditions and we think more about what each condition kind of what it is, what its profile looks like, we can start to gain some insight into the impact of the pandemic. Now, I know there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm not going to read you every number. Don't worry. Um, and a lot of this you probably already know. So I'm just going to touch on a couple points. This data, again, reflects our Springbok clients. Your data may vary, right, depending on your population. So let's start looking at musculoskeletal, the top contributor to cost. What you'll notice here is that the costs are made up almost entirely of medical payments. 
So not a lot of drug costs go into this category. And you'll also notice going across the screen that while only 7% of these cases involve a surgery, those 7% make up 60% of the cost in that category. So basically, most of the cost in this category has to do with orthopedic surgeries. So this is where your joint replacements are, this is where your arthroscopies are, those types of things. Now we already know just from observation that orthopedic procedures dropped off significantly, right, during, during the early months of the pandemic. So we can then assume, well, musculoskeletal cost is going to drop quite a bit as well. And you might then contrast that with something like cancer. In cancer, you notice 42% of the total cost comes from drugs. So that's basically your chemotherapy drugs, right? Whether they're over the counter or infused, not over the counter, but prescription filled or um, infusions. For cancer, just about a third of the cases involve surgery. And then those surgical cases represent about half of the cost. So in cancer, there probably was some delays in surgeries just because of, you know, inpatient facilities not being available, PPE limitations, stuff like that. But we did not see that chemotherapy or radiation therapy were impacted significantly. So that from that, we can sort of say, OK, that means cancer probably wasn't you know, impacted nearly as much as musculoskeletal was. So hopefully now you're, you're starting to catch on how looking at these, looking at costs by disease or by condition can help you understand that different conditions might have been affected really differently by the pandemic. And then that, because of that, they might adjust differently to a new normal as we go forward. Some background noise. I don't know if um, someone on the conference board wants to mute whoever's. Thank you. So going back to our eight conditions and looking at the, um, the significance of the cost reduction since March, this little graph here shows you by those eight conditions where the big drop-offs were. So things like musculoskeletal, which is what we could have guessed, right, knowing how much of that comes from surgery, um, infections, gastrointestinal and preventive care all showed really big decreases in costs during March and April and continued through the year. Now you'll notice that, you know, infections and um, uh, mild and moderate infections has a seasonality to it. So that might have dropped off a little bit anyway, just because it's spring and there's a little bit less of that going on in the country. But in general, um, most of this was caused, we believe, was caused by the pandemic. Now, the things that dropped off the most tend to be things that include a lot of elective procedures, a lot of surgeries, a lot of elective invasive procedures, as well as other things that could be less serious and maybe postponed easily, more easily. So like preventive care, mild infections, those might be things where people were able to take care of things at home or they just postponed things knowing there wasn't a lot of risk. You'll also notice that diabetes and cancer were pretty flat. They were pretty much unaffected in terms of cost. So when you start to think about this um, in terms of what was and wasn't affected, it also brings up an interesting point in when you distinguish between acute conditions and chronic conditions. So when we think about this through a clinical lens, we often divide care up into acute conditions, well care, and chronic conditions. And you've, I'm sure you've all thought about that before. Um, what we noticed in the pandemic era here is that the, part, the, the proportion of care of cost that went toward chronic conditions is much larger than what was going to acute and well care. And basically, that's exactly what we noted earlier. You know, the things that have a lot of acute conditions in them dropped off. The things that were more chronic tended to be more stable. Now, part of that is because of drug spending. A lot of what goes into chronic care is prescription drug costs, and we know those were not affected. Um, but it could also be that you know the, the, the less expensive types of care for chronic conditions were what were dropped, and the more expensive things were kept. Acute conditions, on the other hand, those dropped off a lot. And I want to make the point that acute conditions doesn't just mean colds and ear infections and simple things. It can also mean things like appendicitis, things like gallstones, right? It can be um, pretty significant high-risk things, but they're just acute in nature. Now, some of you might remember early in the pandemic hearing news reports about this sudden drop-off in emergency care. Um, physicians were, were 
a little bit panicked in that, you know, how come people aren't having heart attacks and they aren't having appendicitis? <laughs> and so we took a look in our data at the two, two of what would be considered the most common reasons people go to the ER, abdominal pain and chest pain. And we did see that the incidence both of both of them dropped off a lot. Now, we know that most of the time, abdominal pain and chest pain end up not being serious. They're not emergent. It's, you know, it's some sort of temporary situation and they resolve. However, we also know that some portion of abdominal pain cases turn out to be appendicitis. And we also know that some portion of chest pain visits turn out to be heart attacks or AMI. So we wanted to look at the trend in those two specific diagnoses across that same time period. And that's what's in the lower graph there. So we do see a decrease in diagnosed AMI during March and April. Now, did fewer people have heart attacks? Or were people just too afraid to go to the doctor, to the ER? Are they now living with some amount of heart damage, you know, that isn't yet discovered? We don't know. We think it's probably a little both. But you notice that appendicitis did not have that same drop off. Now, it's possible that something like appendicitis is a little harder to ignore and a little harder to avoid going to the hospital for. So this, sum, this summarizes my, ends my first portion of the presentation. So when we're thinking about this whole mid-COVID timeframe, it's really helpful to look at what types of care what different types of care were affected using a clinical lens. And the data I've shown you so far is all from our Springbok Book of Business, and I want to reiterate that your population might look different, right? Everybody, every population is different. You have a different demographic mix, a different disease profile. But understanding how your population looks and the underlying conditions and the care needs of them pre-pandemic, right, that helps you understand which microtrends might be of interest to you and what might happen next. So I'm going to move into the second section of the presentation. I see there's a lot of questions coming in on the chat, and we have been asked that we're going to hold the questions till the end. So please know that we're seeing them and we're making note of them, so we will get to the questions. So moving on to the second section here, let's talk about what might happen next. So early on when COVID hit, there were a lot of predictions about a big surge that was coming, right? First it was going to be the second half of 2020, now it's going to be 2021, there's going to be this huge cost surge. And we've heard estimates, you know, all over the board. Um, PwC has a range they've, they've published that suggests an increase in cost of anywhere from 4 to 10% in 2021. And then we've seen other sources with even bigger estimates or smaller estimates. So the, the truth is, you know, nobody knows, right? Nobody really knows what's going to happen over what period of time. But if we continue to think of this through a, clini a clinical perspective, we think we can speculate with a little bit more a little bit more intelligence than just sort of, you know, throwing darts at a board, if you will. I'm having trouble changing the slide there. So to talk about this part of the presentation, I want to think about care against three different categories. There's, there's care that's going to be just completely avoided. It didn't happen. It now no longer needs to happen. That's an avoided cost. Right? There's also delayed costs. So these are things that didn't happen, but they're still going to happen, and they're going to happen at some point in the future, and, and the cost will be incurred. And then in a few cases, there might be new types of care with new costs that come along. So going back to our top eight conditions again, this table summarizes our best guess from what we've seen so far of what these microtrends will look like, given those different profiles of care for each category. So for example, for musculoskeletal, we know that there was a significant portion of cost that didn't happen. It didn't occur. And we know that a lot of that was related to surgeries. And when we look to the future, then the question becomes, are those surgeries going to happen? Or are they just going to go away? So sometimes, you know, the postponement might have negated the need, right? The desire of the patient might have changed. The, the, the condition may have resolved. They may have decided to go a different way. So it might be a little of both, but we think that a lot of it probably will be rescheduled and that, you know, that cost probably will end up being delayed. So that's why there's a, 
you know, significant icon in that category. So as I mentioned before, and somewhat thankfully, uh, cancer treatment was not impacted significantly by COVID. So we don't think there's going to be a big delayed cost or a big surge around cancer care. There were some drops in cancer screenings. So people weren't necessarily getting their mammograms or their PAP. Um, that could result in more cancer cases in the coming months that are diagnosed at a more advanced stage. We don't know that yet, but that's why we have the little net new cost potential icon there, because that, that is a possibility that we'll, we'll learn over time. Mental health. Uh, so there was a lot of concern, a lot of publications about mental health early in the pandemic and concerns about people not getting their treatment and what was going to happen. But what, we sh what our data show is that mental health and substance abuse care almost seamlessly transitioned to telehealth. So in March and April, and I'll talk about this more later, telehealth exploded. You probably already know this. And there was not a significant change in mental health and substance abuse costs. So we think that that sort of just flipped over into the telehealth world and continued on at its normal rate. Now, there's also some early reports about a potential uptick in new mental health diagnoses as a result of the pandemic and as a result of everything else going on in the world, frankly. So this would create some amount of a net new cost, but we really don't know yet what that's going to look like. So if you go down the list, I'm not going to walk through all of these, but if you go down the list, you'll see that each of these categories has its own anticipated um, you know, pattern or, or behavior, expected behavior. And we think that you know, the biggest contributors to delaying costs are either going to be complications because things were missed that should have happened, or perhaps canceled elective procedures. Now, we don't know about the first one, but we can make some good guesses about the second one, about elective procedures. So we've already seen that surgeries are a significant cost driver for musculoskeletal. And most of the surgeries in that category are what we would call elective. And I want to make sure everyone understands that elective does not mean optional. So it just means that it's a schedulable service. It's something that doesn't tend to happen on an emergency basis very often. And it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's able to be scheduled, it's able to be planned. We already mentioned musculoskeletal, but across all conditions, elective procedures make up about 20% of all healthcare spending in a typical year. And just like the musculoskeletal surgeries, a lot of those might resolve or they might be reconsidered and they might still occur, leading to an, up, an upcoming surge. So what are all those elective procedures? In our clients' data, we saw that 50% on a normal year, again, this is based on 2019 information, 50% of all elective procedure costs fall into orthopedic and gastrointestinal surgeries. And the top three procedures are colonoscopies, spinal fusions, and knee replacements. So this is all from a cost perspective, not necessarily volume. So we anticipate that these different types of procedures will probably rebound different in different ways. Um, those procedures that are really related more toward quality of life issues, like you know, pain relief or mobility constraints, those are probably more likely to be avoided than things that are required, say, for diagnostic purposes. And the diagnostic purposes procedures are probably more likely to be scheduled sooner, depending on the severity of the diagnosis that you're trying to diagnose. <laughs> um, so for example, if you want, you know, if you're scheduled to have a biopsy to rule out cancer, that's probably considered a lot more urgent than an arthroscopic surgery for a meniscus tear in your knee. Um, so again, you know, understanding your population, understanding the conditions that drive cost and what types of procedures have been postponed is really important in understanding what's likely to happen next. There's a few other healthcare trends that we wanted to mention that, that have some bearing on what's going to happen next. You've probably read a lot about the financial pressures under um, that our providers are experiencing right now, 
and that's really both facilities and practitioners. Um, facilities, of course, lost a huge stream of revenue with all of those elective procedures that I mentioned before. So they're, you know, they're, they, they're very eager to renew that stream of revenue, put it that way. Um, independent practitioners, on the other hand, you know, they often had to close their offices. They were without any revenue. Some of them have transitioned to telehealth. Some have done so more successfully than others. Um, some of them are going out of business. And ultimately, a lot of them are going to end up consolidating. And consolidation often means increased health care costs. Then we've also seen changes around the way we deliver care. So I mentioned the increase in telemedicine. Um, it was extraordinary, and it, it continues to be you know, well above its pre-pandemic rates. And many patients avoided hospitalization during this time as well, and they were essentially forced into alternatives like home health care, and those can be really effective alternatives. So these trends could continue into the future at some rate. And then finally, we haven't really talked about COVID testing itself and the cost of treating the virus. Um, of course, there's a lot of unknowns around that. You know, there'll be cost of vaccinations that come along, hopefully soon. Um, we have seen that the initial cost of treating a COVID case has gone down a little bit. So if the very first cases were extremely high cost in our data, um, they've been slowly coming down as presumably providers get more familiar with how to treat it, what treatments work, they can treat it more efficiently. Um, but really, we're going on very little data because there is not a lot of hospitalization for COVID in our commercial populations today. And then testing, of course, is becoming more and more widespread. And even though that's not super expensive, high volume can, can you know, add up to a decent amount of cost. So in summary, different types of care can result in different kinds of return to normal patterns and behaviors. And understanding your particular population and its particular clinical profile can help you understand better what might happen. So, and then in addition to your population and its clinical profile, other factors like provider consolidation, telehealth, things like that, are also going to probably impact 2021 costs. So understanding all of these things I think we just lost Anne for a second. Hopefully, he uh, she can join very quickly. I apologize oh. for the inconvenience. Sure. Here she comes. Oh, thank goodness. Can you guys hear me? I'm substitute for Anne. Yeah, I just. <laughs> thank you, Penny. It just dropped me all of a sudden. I luckily have that a section break. Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for the slides to come back up here so that I can advance them. Okay, there we go. So we're moving into part three now of what we can actually do with all of this information, right? So the title of our presentation was Opportunity Amidst Chaos. So you might be asking yourself, what's the opportunity? And what we've shared so far gives you opportunity in terms of understanding. We think there's a big opportunity to actually influence healthcare spending during this period of time, during this return to normal phase. So, you know, COVID has disrupted healthcare probably more than anything else in our lifetimes. And the thing is about disruption is disruption can be a catalyst, right? So this disruption could be a catalyst for reinvention and improvement of our healthcare system. And we think that the industry has some real potential to make progress on issues that have been, frankly, have been problematic for many, many years that a lot of us have been dealing with. So first, I want to talk briefly about the treatments that we don't want to discourage from returning. <laughs> so there's a lot of healthcare that is critical and incredibly important and time sensitive and really emergent. And we don't ever want to discourage patients from seeking that type of care. In fact, we want to encourage them to get back to that type of care. So high value preventive care like immunizations and cancer screenings and you know the chronic care maintenance type of things, um, those are recommended care and they're recommended for good reasons, right? They prevent bad things from happening. They prevent later, more serious, more expensive things. So the opportunity here is to ensure that all of these types of care are available and that they're being utilized appropriately. But, there's always a but, 
not all care is necessary. So most of you have probably heard the terms that are shown in this diagram, uh, low value care, preference sensitive treatments, and supply sensitive care. And they're all related to each other because they all identify types of care that are potentially wasteful and they could be avoided without negatively impacting health. But we're going to talk about each of these categories uh, separately here. So low value care, to, to put really simply, is treatments that have no proven benefit. So these are types of care that, despite having no evidence supporting them, they're still very frequently delivered. Um, you can see the statistics on here that the task force on low value care identified these top five services, all low value care, all shouldn't be happening ever, and we're currently spending $25 billion on these every year. So, you know, it's not just common sense that they shouldn't be happening. <laughs> they are happening. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the industry right now about putting things like this on a list of do not restart, meaning, you know, these might have stopped during COVID. Let's not let them start over again. Here's our chance to, to prevent them from happening and eradicate them. Now, preference-sensitive care is a little bit different because those are clinically proven treatments that are effective in patients, certain patients, but sometimes there's an alternative and usually a less expensive, less risky alternative that's also available. And so this is where the decision part comes in, right? So the decision to provide one of these treatments should be made based on the preferences of the patient. After they're given, you know, education on the pros and the cons, they understand the risks and the rewards, and that's where we come up with the name preference sensitive. So there's some examples listed on the slide. And again, no one's saying these should not happen, right? The, but what evidence shows is that they happen a lot more often in some parts of the country than others in some geographic areas than others. And so what that tells us is there's something going on besides just patient preference. And that's the kind of, you know, we want to make sure that the decisions are being made consistently and, and by well-educated patients and providers. And then finally, supply-sensitive care. So this might be a new term for some of you. Um, I hadn't heard it used quite this way before. I, but it describes a phenomenon that was first noted by public health professor Milton Romer back in the 60s. And he investigated how the number of hospital beds per capita affected hospitalization rates. And his theory basically says hospital beds that are built tend to be used. And this has been expanded over the years to say basically in areas where care is more available, meaning there's more supply, then demand tends to follow whether or not that demand is clinically justified. So that variation still exists today. And the Dartmouth Atlas, by the way, has a great write-up on this and a great um, summary of the current variation that we see. So how does supply-sensitive care specifically relate to COVID-19? Um, well, we've learned through the pandemic that decreases in hospitalizations doesn't have to mean poor outcomes. Um, we've seen that Promoting inpatient care or specialist care might not always be as necessary as we might have thought in terms of outcomes. And we, we sort of inadvertently fell into what might be called the world's largest field experiment <laughs> that can help us determine when this type of care is really important. So rather than returning to the pre-COVID behaviors, we should take this opportunity to learn from this experiment and reshape the way we treat chronic disease. So considering all three of these topics, low value care, preference sensitive care, supply sensitive care, what can we do as employers to help create a paradigm shift away from unnecessary care? We think that it's a combination of patient education and steerage along with policy changes, benefit changes, and cost sharing, and cost sharing that's more targeted, that discourages certain care when it's inappropriate. And we think that could work together and really put a dent into unnecessary care. And these are not new concepts, right? These are, these are things that have been being talked about for at least as long as I've been in healthcare. Um, but what is new and what is different is that the whole healthcare system just got shaken up, right? And many patients and maybe even providers might now be realizing that there is a decent portion of care that really is unnecessary and really can be avoided, and we don't necessarily see 
the clinical repercussions we were afraid we might see. So we should try to take advantage of that new understanding and rebuild a system that avoids as much of that waste as we can. Another area of change, of course, is the delivery mechanisms, right? So I mentioned earlier that telehealth services exploded during March and April. Um, in our customers' data, we saw an increase in telehealth visits from about three to over 75 visits per thousand members per month. So I'm going to say that again. An average of three visits per thousand people per month to over 75 visits per thousand per month. So that's like an over 2,000% increase for those of you doing the math at home. Um, now, the cost went up a little bit as well. It went from about $40 to about $90 a visit. And that could be for a lot of reasons. Telehealth wasn't always reimbursed at the same rate as in-person care, which was changed during the pandemic by a lot of carriers. It could also be because there were more specialists and expensive types of services being done through telehealth. But overall, this, the, the overall cost of healthcare went down incredible, you know, incredible amounts while telehealth went up like crazy. So, you know, I think of it as kind of like working from home, right? We had the technology, people were sort of slow to adapt it for a whole bunch of reasons, and then all of a sudden we had no choice. <laughs> we had to work from home, we had to use telehealth, and we made it work. And what we need to do now is make sure that the payment structure keeps up with the technology and that providers and patients aren't financially discouraged from telehealth and this type of delivery. And home care and remote monitoring also, those have come a long way and they were kind of forced to be used at a larger scale. And early outcomes suggest this was, this was a successful experiment and it costs a lot less in both time and money. And then finally, you know, we as employers, we have a unique opportunity to really support our employees as they come back to work. So a lot of places are reopening, um, people are coming back from furlough, and many of them are facing financial hardships um, because of furloughs, their own or, or family members, or reduced, other reduced income. So what we want to be able to do is make sure that getting appropriate health care is not just one more financial stressor on our people, right? We want to work with them to ensure that they're able to get the care they need to stay healthy and to stay productive. And there's a few suggestions here on the screen. So to wrap up, you know, the disruption that was caused by COVID, while, you know, incredibly challenging on many levels, we think also offers us an opportunity to attack some of the problems that have really plagued our healthcare system for many years. And we have a chance, we have a, a small window to reinvent what healthcare looks like going forward through things like novel plan designs and new reimbursement strategies and patient education. And I want to stress that's a really important component. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. And I would like to turn this back over to Penny to wrap us up. Thanks, Anne. And in particular, Anne, I want to I want to take this opportunity to thank you and your team for your commitment and dedication to really, um, from the very beginning, staying on top of the trends and the things that we were seeing with COVID-19 and helping us um, identify quickly how we could begin to serve our customers with data. So today's presentation was great, as usual, and I really appreciate all the research you did to put into the presentation. Um, so now what? Um, let's talk about just a few key takeaways. That's my job in this scenario. So just thinking about the things that Anne said, I think uh, we see, I see five key takeaways. One is um, know your pre-COVID baseline. So going back and taking a look at your population, particularly by those uh, eight or nine disease or condition categories that Ann pointed out that make up 50% of your cost. Um, different categories of healthcare expenditure, is, they're going to respond differently to this pandemic. And so understanding where you were at at baseline before this started is a really important thing. Um, at Springbuck, we also help our customers to go beyond just looking at the expenses and the cost trends of those different conditions. Um, by utilizing data enrichment and our proprietary algorithms to help our customers identify gaps in care based on evidence-based medicine for those conditions 
and forecasted expense. And so those things are what really help you to understand your pre-COVID baseline. And then next, look for your microtrends. So um, as Ann talked about, we expect those various different conditions to react differently, and it's going to depend on your population and the community that you're in. Um, Ann named off several different things, uh, whether it's site of care, or the availability of care, or uh, whether it is the type of care that will make a difference. Um, and also, I think part of the, uh, what I heard was part of the hint in knowing your microtrends is really understanding your population's clinical profile, um, uh, particularly their clinical risk profile. So at, at Springbuck, we often uh, work with our clients to apply um, an episode risk grouper to help us see across the population where risk may lie. Uh, and, um, and I really appreciated your comment about thinking about those high value care elements around um, really important treatments as well as preventive care. Those things are some of the things that have fallen off during COVID and it's important to come back to your employee audience and encourage that type of care to happen, whether it's with incentives or education, those things make a difference. And we may need to remind populations that this type of care is important. And then finally, create a new normal. I love that title. Um, there are other factors beyond patient conditions that are impacting healthcare um, more broadly and will likely affect future costs. I thought your points were great about use this as an opportunity to maybe take some of the things that we've tried for years but put a fresh spin on it um, as we start to take a look at how COVID has disrupted things. So as employers, you're uniquely positioned um, to encourage returning to you know, an improved normal um, that better serves your population and encourages uh, efficient and effective care. Um, to wrap up here, I just want to say you've had the chance to hear uh, Ann Fisher talk about a lot of the work that our data science and clinical team has done thinking about COVID. We would like to uh, offer the opportunity to just network with you and consult if you have any questions. So you can see my email address here, pmore at springbuck.com. Reach out to me and I will connect with Ann and we would love to spend 30 minutes to an hour um, just talking with you. And I think that's it. So Amy, what kinds of questions did we get today? Great. Thank you so much, Penny and Ann. Fascinating. Um, I saw that a few comments from our audience and seeing this is fascinating, uh, fantastic information and interpretation. We'd like to get more information about the data collection and analysis. Uh, I think uh, we have a question about uh, are your data collected from the provider perspective or the payer perspective? Is this a question that Penny or Anne you can uh, address? Yeah, sure, I can take that one. So I should have mentioned this when I was going through our data. Our data is collected from the payer perspective. So we primarily use claims, medical and drug claims data, to do all of our analyses. And then as Penny mentioned, you know, we've done a bunch of literature research as well. But it is definitely from the payer perspective. Great, thank you. And I saw two uh, interesting questions and comments regarding pregnancy. Uh, I think one of our audience mentioned that uh, um, Ellen read some, somewhere the pregnancies are down since March. Do you have any data on that? If so, this is going to be an impact six to nine months down the road. And Greg uh, commented uh, wondering whether the pregnancy decrease is just a reporting delay are people simply doing a home test and delaying prenatal care? So Anne and Penny, uh, anything to add here? Yeah, um, so it kind of ties into the last question. Because we're coming at this from a payer perspective and a claims perspective, we often don't know a lot about pregnancy early on until we get to the point of delivery and then we find out someone was pregnant. Um, but I've, I've seen some of the same information. At first, there was a it's going to there's going to be a baby boom because of the lockdown, and then it was no, everyone's afraid to get pregnant. No, no one's going to get pregnant. <laughs> and I think we just don't know yet. I think it's going to come clear obviously in the next few months. Um, there's also some question about 
the impact of COVID um, on newborns if the mother was infected. You know, that's something else we'll be learning more about as time goes on. But I really don't have a great uh, trend or anything to share with you at this time. I can tell you that at Springbuck, it hasn't really put a dent in the rate of our employees uh, expecting. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Uh, I think we have a minute for uh, one last question. Um, someone asked, how effective do you think telemedicine is in treatment of COVID? Yeah, so I, I have to preface this by saying I'm definitely not a doctor. We have one on our team. She's probably listening in, but she can't talk. Um, when I was talking about telehealth and telemedicine, just to be clear, it wasn't necessarily in treatment of COVID at all. It was in treatment of all the other things that people were afraid to or could not go to the physician's office for. So when we looked at our telemedicine data, that huge spike, I would say, I don't have the number right in front of me, but a good portion of it was actually mental health services. So it was mental health counseling and therapy sessions that used to happen in person and now are happening through telehealth. We also, also saw a decent amount of sort of general signs and symptoms types of diagnoses. I imagine a lot of that was people calling their physician to say, do my symptoms suggest that I might need a COVID test or, you know, should I be worried, basically, because I know a lot of that went on, especially in March and April. Um, in terms of actually treating COVID, I mean, I think it's like anything else. I think it's a matter of the severity of the patient. I think it's always probably better to to ask before you, you know, run into the emergency room, but it really depends on, on the situation. So. Good question. All those are very good Great, questions. Yeah, I noticed that we still have a couple minutes left, and I sorry, I missed one question. Uh, and as you talk about the micro trends, there's a specific question about uh, the micro trends. Have you looked at what happened specifically to low value care in March? For example, vitamin D screen screenings as part of any remaining in person PCT visits. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I saw who that came from, and I think I know that person. Uh, and no, we haven't yet, but I think it's a really good idea, and I think we should look into that. Great. Thank you so much. And I personally have one question, uh, which as I found that the, uh, the eight conditions categories, you mentioned are very interesting. So you described the top eight condition categories that are made up the 50% of spending. So what are some of the other high contributors that are not among the top eight? for example, like asthma and heart disease. Yeah, yeah. So I picked the top eight simply because that was a nice cutoff for 50% of the cost. Um, but things that came up, like ranked very close to those, were things like um, nervous system disorders, which includes things like migraine and cerebrovascular disease and even things like carpal tunnel, so anything that has to do with your nervous system. Um, other things that popped up higher were coronary artery disease, um, lung diseases, which would include your asthma, also COPD. Um, and then and those are the ones that pop in. Oh, benign, benign neoplasm. So things that turn out to not be cancer, those, that's a pretty high ranking category as well. Great. Thank you. And I think we got start to get more questions. Um, I think we, this is really our last question. Is there any data that looks at how uh, driven PCP visit behavior is driven by comfortability uh, with a specific provider, and if there's any effect related to telemedicine increases? That's a really good question. Uh, that's a um, question from Grad Scott. Yeah, I see that. Any data that looks at how driven I don't know of any data like that today. If there is, I would imagine that it has to do, it would have to be survey collected information, but I think that's a really interesting idea, and I'm hoping someone is measuring that kind of stuff, but I don't know of any data that we have access to right now that would answer that question. And I see someone ask for the resource link, so I changed to that slide, but also um, this presentation will be available for them to download, right, Amy? So if they need those resource links, Great. Perfect. And Penny, and, and thank you so much for today. Uh, great insights. I'm sure that our audience will learn a lot from your data insights and observations. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, before...
Great, thank you. So before uh, I close today's session, I'd like to um, just share a couple of uh, upcoming events of the conference board. As the first is uh, coming on September 14th to 18th, we have our virtual event, the IBI Conference Board House and Productivity Forum. Um, the good news, the virtual event is free for our conference board members. And for non-members, you can use the code KN1 to save 150. Um, so please don't miss this great opportunity. And if you enjoy today's webcast, there are a few upcoming webcasts from the conference board. Uh, you can register by clicking the links in the downloadable presentation, or you can uh, visit our website to see the full uh, list of upcoming uh, virtual events. And finally, if you are interested in collaborating with the conference board to produce another great event like what you saw today, please uh, reach out to us. You can see, uh, find the email address on the screen. And thank you again for joining us today. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.